All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are here at this extraordinary endeavor uh, that is a brainchild of Kenya McKnight Ahad. Now for, I mean, I, ever since I've known Kenya, now spanning back somewhere in the range of 10 to 12 years, she has been talking about this mission. And Zara, the big vision, is just one example of the things that we're working on throughout the city of Minneapolis. So about nine, 10 months ago, we set up a, a series of work groups. One of them was focused on community safety, one new government structure, but the primary piece that we're talking today about was economic inclusion, making sure that we're not just getting back to the old normal, but we're blowing by that old normal to see true transformational change. Uh, among the recommendations that that work group came up with was to create or recreate a black middle class. We have had a black middle class of substantial form in Minneapolis in the past. There are extraordinary black, and, black middle and upper classes uh, throughout our country, and we want to make sure that there is, are those kind of routes that exist here in Minneapolis, that we break down the systemic barriers that have perpetually left black and brown people out of the equation, whether that's through lending practices, access to money, social capital, redlining, restrictive covenants that run with the land, you name it, there have been a series of impediments. We're trying to undo that, making sure that the precision of our solutions now match the precision of the harm that was initially inflicted. And that, that harm was precise. And so what you will see in this proposed budget is $17.5 million worth of investment in the economic inclusion space. About 7.5 million of that is specifically dedicated on a one-time basis to jump-starting this recovery in the right way. So it's going to things like Zara, uh, to the tune of about a million dollars that we're making sure that this extraordinary endeavor can take shape. If you talk to Kenya about it, and she's gonna talk very shortly here about it, the whole mission is to provide that foundation from which extraordinary talent can rise. It's to make sure that we are accessing every bit of talent that we have here on the table in Minneapolis. Uh, and if you look at the talent that is least accessed, where we are least realizing our full potential, it's black women. Black women are creating businesses at a rate that is far superior than almost any other demographic out there. So we need to make sure that they have the tools that they need in order to run with a big vision, to become an entrepreneur, to live that brilliant life, uh, and to start the business that, for instance, Kenya has had an idea about for, like I said, about 10 to 12 years. Uh, and what she has talked about through that time is now happening. It's happening in the form of the Black Women's Wealth Alliance, which is making sure that when you walk in the door as a black woman entrepreneur, you have access to lending resources, to banks. You understand how to set up a business model, that you know exactly all of the different pieces that you need in order to succeed. And by the way, it's impossible to become an entrepreneur if you don't have your wellness in check, if you aren't of the right state of mind, if you aren't healthy, if you don't have that necessary tender love and care. Think for yourself about the instances in your life when you're having great success. It's when you're taken care of. It's when you feel loved. It's when you've got a community of support around you. It's when both your physical and mental health are at a state for you to be the best version of yourself. That's a huge part of what Zara is doing, whether that's through massage therapy or, or acupuncture, uh, whether that's through making sure that you get the proper healing that you need or just a kind voice to listen and talk to. This is an organization that set it up. And if you talk to Ken Kenya, the data is pretty clear. If you look at where the demand is, if you look at for what women and men are looking for on the north side, they want this. They want Zara. This is just one example. You're also going to hear from, from Anthony Taylor, who's doing an incredible job over at Dreamland on 38th Street on the south side. And I know council president here is going to talk about this very shortly as well, which is this exceptional event center, which can also add to the commercial space that will be available on 38th. By the way, in the past, 38th Street has been a mecca for black entrepreneurs. Council president and others are looking to recreate that mecca. And so you'll see what this is all about. 
Also, you got to double down on stuff that we know is working and has worked. And, you know, R Renee Dossman, who's done an incredible job down at Midtown Global Market, uh, you know, th they've, been through, they've been through hell over the last couple of years, but they've been so resilient, they've been tough, and they're coming back again and again and again. Um, these are organizations, these are businesses, these are endeavors that our extraordinary council members up here support. And council member Jeremiah Ellison has been a big proponent of Zara and the Black Women's Wealth Alliance from the very beginning. Council member Jason Chavez, I think, pretty much lives over at Midtown Global Market because he wants so badly for that thing to be a huge success. Um, this, this is a, a really important step for our city. Um, the, there's a couple messages that I just want to say in completion. Uh, the first is we set those that work group up and when we did it wasn't just going to be a recommendation that went in a binder and sat on a shelf. These were recommendations that are being utilized. They said they wanted to recreate the black uh, middle class through a series of, uh, of work like the commercial property development fund. So we're doubling down in that to make sure that black business owners can own not just their own business, but the underlying real estate. They said that they wanted to create opportunity for ownership in residential. And so we're du doubling down on programs like Homes Minneapolis to make sure that, that that wealth can be passed from one generation to another through the ownership of a home. That work group said that we need to be invest, investing in people directly, in people and in businesses that are doing this work. Zara, Dreamland, these are just two of the latest examples of that work. You know, I'm so excited for the change that's taking place right now. Um, you know, this is just the latest example of what I think we're going to see over the next couple of years, and it's going to be an exciting time. So get ready, buckle in. It's going to be a wild uh, but extraordinary ride. Uh, so, you know, Council President, has been working on this for quite a long time. Um, and whether she's reciting poetry uh, or she's talking about a big, gigantic vision that we all need to get behind, she's someone who is an inspiration to so many in this city. I know she's an inspiration for me personally. Um, please give a, give a warm round of applause to our council president, Andrea Jenkins. Thank you, Mayor Fry, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrea Jenkins. I am the Minneapolis City Council President, and I represent Ward 8. Uh, before I just get too deep in my remarks, I want to just say congratulations to my dear friend, Kenya Ahad McKnight, for this amazing um, facility that will uh, uplift and um, create space for women entrepreneurs my own daughter is an entrepreneur in the city of Minneapolis and so I know the importance of uh, supporting these kinds of opportunities for young people for business owners to succeed in in this economy um, I'm here on the north side but I'm here to talk about some of the things that are happening on the south side particularly 38th Street and the vision that we've created called the 38th Street Thrive Project, which will uh, revitalize and reimagine the history of 38th Street to recapture the energy that was once known as the Black Business District in Minneapolis during the times of redlining. That was disrupted by 35W much like the Rondo community uh, was disrupted by the freeway. But we are going to bring that vitality, that entrepreneurship, that spirit, that collective spirit back to 38th Street. And one of the first projects that we are kicking off is the Dreamland Project um, that's being supported by the Cultural Wellness Center. I'm proud and thrilled that there is an allocation in the proposed budget to support that project and uh, looking forward to continuously working to help bring more resources to not only that project, but to the Subanthony Community Center, 
which is a um, substantial part of the 38th Street Thrive Plan. We want to bring solar energy to the community uh, through a solar demonstration project and create a resiliency hub so that when we do have these um, catastrophic events like the uprisings that we saw in 2020 or some phenomenal weather event, that we are prepared as a community to deal with those kinds of issues. And so um, just really excited to be here with you all today to announce these investments in black business um, and economic development to be able to, to, as the mayor described, continuously support the black middle class here in Minneapolis. And so next, I think I'm gonna bring up my friend and colleague, uh, Representative Jeremiah Ellison, who represents the Fifth Ward. Uh, thank you very much, Council President Jenkins, and uh, thank you to the mayor for this investment. Uh, we all know that home ownership has always been a, a, a vital and, and stable way for uh, people to build wealth. But the thing that has been denied the most on the north side is access to commercial property towards that same end, towards wealth building. Uh, what Kenya's built here is tremendous. Uh, and I'm proud to say that through some, of, through some of these investments and some of the systemic responses that we've had towards, uh, uh, towards creating economic equity in our city, um, you know, we, we've probably got more local black owners along West Broadway than ever before. Um, and yet the number's still too low. That's why these investments and these continued investments are so vitally important. Uh, not only are we seeing Kenya here on the corridor, we're seeing uh, folks like Tri Construction, uh, Calvin Littlejohn owning on the corridor. We see Kenya owning on the corridor. Uh, we see uh, 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 like the Get Down Coffee and uh, Houston White owning up uh, in, in Ward 4. But that's not all we need, right? We need 50 Houstons. We need, uh, we need 50 Calvins. We need 100 Kenyas, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think that the, the beautiful thing is, is that they exist. They already exist. Kenya created this space because she knows they exist. They just need the resources to be supported. Uh, they need uh, opportunity. And they need the city to uh, uh, both aid and get out the way in creating the kind of corridors that we deserve, the kind of equity we deserve when it comes to economic development. So I'm very excited for this project, very excited for the many, many more projects to come along West Broadway, uh, along the rest of the north side, uh, and along the rest of the city. Uh, and with that, happy to introduce my colleague, Jason Chavez. Hello everyone, my name is Jason Chavez, and I have the honor of privilege of representing the Ninth Ward on the Minneapolis City Council. I get to share two cultural districts, 38th Street and East Lake Street, which are very important areas to the city of Minneapolis from our cultural corridors. I'm very happy to be here with the mayor, my council colleagues, and these amazing community leaders behind me today. Over the past few years, we've seen our small businesses struggle, and oftentimes they've had to make very difficult decisions just to stay afloat. We've seen our East Lake Street corridor burst into flames, and the pandemic has forced them to make tough decisions just to stay afloat. The impact of the pandemic continues to add hardship to our small business owners, and especially talking about the East Lake Street corridor. I'm proud that the mayor and the council will be voting on a $400,000 investment and funding for competitive grant for our cultural market grants. It's a great investment for our cultural corridors, especially for our Midtown Global Market to make sure that we can bounce back in this economy. I also want to talk a little, about, a little bit about the employment opportunities and economic development for young and communities of color on the Lake Street Corridor. The mayor also set aside a $250,000 investment for the Rise Up Center, a Rise Up Center that can help employ and train people of color or immigrants and people who have been struggling here due to the pandemic over the past few years. We know on the Lake Street Corridor, people need employment opportunities. And this Rise Up Center, this economic development opportunity is going to help build that uh, here for our communities and talking about our immigrants that matter as well, making sure that they have that access to economic development in our corridor. So, and I'm going to pass it on to the person you've been waiting for, Kenya. <laughs> 
All right. Um, so I'm asking some of my team members to come with me because I don't do this by myself. It takes a team of people. Um, so for me, a nation rises no higher than its woman. And the conditions of black women will always dictate the conditions of the black nation. It is imperative that we make sure that black women have the essentials we need to thrive and survive and to live and to build good lives through our generations, of our families, of ourselves, and through our cultural lenses. As historical people of this land, it's imperative that we have a middle class here in Minneapolis that shows up as entrepreneurship, that shows up as home ownership, as commercial ownership, as just economic prosperity that can be realized through our own cultural vibrancy. We need a social life here. We need to be celebrated here. We need to be uplifted here. It is the very thing that our ancestors fought for, and it's our time to realize that in these days. So I appreciate the support, the love, the investment, the courage, the leadership, and the vision of the Minneapolis City Council and the, the mayor, Jacob Frey, for having the audacity to create the cultural corridor so that businesses like mine and the other 29 fierce black entrepreneurs who own commercial property on West Broadway can exist, can be here, can create Zaraz, can create um, the building Neon just purchased, create the Capri, Tito Wilson. There's a slew of us who are out here. And what we needed, our city is now stepping up to provide. And so I'm happy to be in this space. I appreciate the support. The Zara is the first wellness, cultural specific retail complex in North Minneapolis. We currently have the only sit down space on West Broadway. And for us, what we're adding is 24 additional retail spaces, an event space, and a food hall to North Minneapolis that will celebrate the diversity of black wellness through, again, retail and direct services. So entrepreneurs like Aisha Wadu here, who currently works in the Zara as a fierce massage therapist, can have a place to realize her dreams too. She's worked as an entrepreneur for over 12 years, but has never had the opportunity to provide her wellness services in her own community that she grew up in North Minneapolis. So there's a rise here to make that a reality for other black women who imagine their spaces of wellness from entrepreneurship and acupuncture, massage therapy, apothecaries, birth centers, etc. Thank you so much and thank you to my team for all your work to make this happen. And I'll now invite up one of my mentors and vibrant people who I love, Ms. Renee Dossman, first black woman president of Neighborhood Development Center. Thank you so much. I'll wait for that motorcycle. <laughs> um, I just want to start in gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you to your staff. Thank you to the support of the market. You know, um, when something's 15 years old, sometimes people forget about it, um, don't think much about it. And so the fact that we are still thinking about the Midtown Global Market and what an institution it has been on the South Side is, is truly humbling for us. Um, the Midtown Global Market, for those of you that don't know, is owned, it's co-owned by the Neighborhood Development Center as well as the Cultural Wellness Center. It's been around for 15 years. There's over 35 vendors in the market that speak over 18 different languages. And um, there's, there's definitely been some tough times in the market, but there's some good things happening and, and that we're looking forward to. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing in the market that this funding will help us support. One of them is we need a refresh. The market's been around for 15 years, so we're doing a refresh of the market to freshen it up a bit. A facelift never hurts anybody. And then the other thing we're doing is we're building out, we noticed when everything happened that the service industries like the eyelash or the eyebrow store actually did fairly well even during the pandemic. And so we're building out more services such as hair salon, 
uh, um, a barber shop and a nail salon. So that's going to be the beauty node that's going to happen inside the market. In addition, there's entrepreneurs in the market that are remodeling and building out their space. We have the Cultural Wellness Center that's building out a, a new health hub in partnership with the University of Minnesota. We have Sean Sherman, the, the Sioux chef. Um, with his Natives nonprofit that's building out a retail concept right there in the market. And then let's not forget about the basement of the market, which, to be honest with you, we've never fully developed. And in partnership with Alina, we're going to build out office space down there. There might be an opportunity for a gym. So when you think about South Minneapolis and you think about that corner of Lake in Chicago, a lot of people think about um, everything that happened and and when I, we just were recently at the State Fair, and we had two restaurants there as well as a retail store, and literally everybody that walked by the booth was like, oh, the market's still open. Oh, I haven't been there in years. So when you think about how you can support these businesses, how you can support these entrepreneurs, it comes down to showing up and visiting them and shopping and patronizing them. So I think about those dark nights, um, and I think about the market being surrounded literally surrounded by entrepreneurs, by residents that live in the townhomes, coming together and the market surviving and being a symbol of hope. And with this, these partnerships and with the support, the market can continue to thrive for generations to come. So I just want to thank you for that and thank you for the support. And now I'll, I'll introduce Anthony Taylor from the Cultural Wellness Center. Anyways, thank you all for being here. So I'm going to start off with some words you'll never forget. Black women to the rescue. Um, and I, um, I really would like to sincerely thank uh, two le community leaders, two friends and mentors. Uh, Kenya McKnight is a continuous partner in conspiring to create better for people. Renee Dasman uh, for her support in what we're doing at the global market and in other areas. And really for Elder Atum, who is not here, for her willingness to allow the Cultural Wellness Center to expand this approach uh, towards development. Um, I'd also like to thank our city council, uh, our mayor. I'd like to name uh, Eric Hansen and CPAD um, as partners in answering a very simple question. Can we make investments in the built environment turn into quality of life improvements for people who live within the community that we are making those changes? Dreamland was a concept that was really initiated in 1937 by Anthony B. Cassius, who actually opened a business in what was relegated and redlined for black people. He opened his first business with a very simple intent that he could build a business that would have social opportunity for people to conspire and create for their own improvement, for their own well-being. CP Andrea Jenkins reinvigorated that idea with the 38 Thrive Plan, and that has, since the murder of George Floyd, turned into a commitment um, that we have actually worked very hard, and she has been a leader of getting this designated as a legacy African-American district, and that we are now working to realize, and this investment in Dreamland is a first step in that. But we've also decided this is not Dreamland, this is about Dreamland on 38th. And this is really a catalyst investment in what we see as really rebuilding a vital economic African-American district that starts at 2nd, goes all the way to George Floyd Square, and someday will actually be an international destination for social justice pilgrims from all over the world. And this has already begun to happen. This is a catalyst investment in an African-American cultural enterprise district, and we will support all of the businesses there. Most importantly, we see this as an opportunity to build quality of life for African-American community members and all community members who live within walking and biking and living distance of 38th and 4th. Thank you all very much. And I'm now going to introduce my partner in crime, Eric Hansen. Good afternoon. I'm Eric Hansen. I'm the city's economic development director, and I want to thank Anthony for the shout out. I really appreciate it. But my role here is not to make the investments. My role is to help the city council and the mayor break down barriers so that we can see the wealth disparities we see in Minneapolis disappear. And those wealth disparities are going to be disappearing because of the investments of these fine people behind me. And we saw that in the unrest. The businesses that were owned locally were the ones that were defended. And those are also the businesses that, def that will reinvest in the local community. And that multiplier effect is what will have the impact over time. 
black women have a disproportionate amount of economic responsibility in um, decision making in their families and so investing in this in these businesses are going to have generational impacts in Minneapolis and hopefully by the time uh, all of the folks behind me are the elders in the room we are seeing that the disparities and the chasm between black and indigenous and people of color and white in Minneapolis has been um, has been breached so I just want to thank you um, I thank the mayor for his leadership to to direct the city staff to make sure that we're always uh, looking at equity and for the city council leadership of uh, council president Jenkins and the council members here about their strategic strategic racial equity action plan that is also making it where we are being very thoughtful and del deliberative about where we're making investments as a city so thank you mayor So the takeaway here is it's happening. This is not more talk. These are steps that are being taken where we are putting our money where our mouth is. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions you might have. I do not have an estimate. So the question is, how many people will benefit from the funding proposed in the new budget, broadly speaking? Um, there are a couple of different yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll pass this over to Eric in just a second here. But I mean, there's the people and the entities, I should say, that are in that are benefiting very directly in that organizations like Zara and individuals like Kenya McKnight are getting the funding. Um, I mean, that's very easy to calculate, uh, but then the number of people that would be dramatically impacted by the work that these organizations do, I would say is, is relatively incalculable. So, um, I don't know, Eric, can you maybe provide a little bit additional context? Well, um, to follow up on what the mayor said, these are direct investments into the real estate of these organizations, and then they'll have um, additional benefits to the, the businesses that they support, uh, the entrepreneurs that they support. Uh, within the mayor's economic inclusion uh, proposal, there's also workforce development investments and career pathways programs. Um, you know, it's, uh, I forget what he has proposed, but you know, the, the, okay. that's in the number of hundreds of, of people that we help through that, find work skills, uh, which is very important right now, because right now the, the state's unemployment rate is about, is, is south of 2%, while the black unemployment rate is north of 7%. So we still have a lot to do, and we have a racial, um, most of our service providers um, have the cultural competence to, to support uh, people of color through training sessions. So. There's, it's, it's not a definitive number, but there's, um, it, it does have a primary benefit, secondary and a tertiary uh, benefit. So there's hundreds of people that are benefiting from the economic development. And, and I, I can add a little bit more. This, this was parts of my original talking points that I nixed, but we can give you directly. Um, so to Eric's point, in a direct capacity, hundreds. Indirectly, thousands. Um, you know, for technical and workforce training, uh, we've got about three million dollars that are invested. It's for there's a youth program, employment and training that's 1.6 million, small business technical assistance program which serves hundreds of people, 700 thousand. There's a career pathways program as well, and that's an expansion for an additional 600 thousand. Um, and then there's the work which we have kind of included tangentially, which is in NOAA preservation, naturally occurring affordable housing as well as home. Um, and then there's the, the direct allocations on a one-time basis, which are the entities that we've discussed today. You, you, you go for it. Yeah, can you? Um, and I don't Please. know if you want to say anything. What I know for sure is, based on the uh, market retail study that the city of Minneapolis conducted in 2014, we knew at that time that over the spending power of North Minneapolis was around $400 million. And of that, about a little more a little bit more than 20 million um, was spent in the health and wellness sector. And at least about, 
I don't know, maybe about 260 million of that leaves the north side because we don't have the business infrastructure that supports the way people spend money. I'm here to retain our own dollars. And I imagine that's true across our community. So what we know for sure is that the work that we're all doing, the businesses that we're creating, the infrastructure we're building, allows us to retain some of those dollars that will be reinvested into the businesses here that in turn create jobs and provide meaningful services for the people who are already paying for these things outside of our community. So for us, that recycling, doubling down allows us to build on the generational wealth, but also grow the local economies of our community that brings us along with the rest of the city. Mr. Mayor or members of council, do you have any reaction this afternoon to a word uh, about the state and Hennepin County investi investigating now uh, Merwin Liquors and the Winters Gas Station after the recent violence there? The State Attorney General's Office and Hennepin County Attorney? Uh, yeah, there is work that is happening in consultation right now with our city of Minneapolis, our, our business licensing team, and making sure that, that our ordinances and laws are properly being enforced. Um, you know, here's the thing. We are looking at every possible avenue to keep our communities safe. We've obviously got to do that within the purview of the law itself, uh, and we are making sure that we are exploring every option that is out there. Um, and, you know, as recently as uh, earlier today and y or yesterday, uh, we were able to get quite a few guns off the streets as well as, as well as quite a few perpetrators of these violent crimes arrested. Um, so, you know, we're moving in the right direction here, but we got a lot of work to do. Did the city ask for the state or the county to help out with this? The, well, so I, I don't know, what, I actually didn't see the specific announcement today, but I, right I mean, you know, the, the, the work is all happening in conjunction. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a secret to anyone that the corner of uh, Lindale and West Broadway has been uh, a real problem for the community for uh, a long time. And I know that ever since I, I've got stepped into office day one, there have been conversations about how to create safety on that corner. Um, uh, as to the investigation, you know, I, I think that any support to create safety on that corner is definitely welcomed. Uh, and I'm just, you know, looking forward to whatever kind of conversations this, uh, this generates. So between the businesses, between myself, between the mayor uh, and the state, uh, I think there's gonna be a lot of conversation um, moving forward. I'm sorry, the second half, please again. So the interviews took place last weekend. Uh, we interviewed the three finalists. And first, what I'll tell you is these are national caliber individuals. Um, was so impressed with the work that this search committee ultimately did. And the individuals that they provided to me, again, were, were national caliber. And I saw that out in the interviews. Um, the uh, formal job offer, we anticipate coming very soon. Certainly by the end of this month, we hope to make an announcement. Uh, and even after the offer itself is given in a formal capacity, uh, we're going to have to make sure that we do the background check, which ultimately runs through the BCA. And so the announcement will come in, in short order here. You know, obviously this is something that we want to expedite as soon as possible, simply because we need you know, that ongoing and clear leadership within the department. Again, I want to thank uh, Interim Chief Amelia Huffman, who has truly increase the speed of change and if you look at the work that she's doing whether it's around overtime uh, or it's around the disciplinary matrix that she really took the initiative to set up um, it's most definitely helped our city for the long haul um, so the answer is again we're, we're looking to have everything not just done wrapped up in a formal offer provided but we're hoping to have an announcement by the end of this month